Okay, so welcome back everybody and uh, welcome to this final session of this online OpenMP course. So first of all this afternoon, I'd like to share with you some uh, tips, helpful hints and pointers to things to watch out, watch out for. So these are things that I've collected over quite a few years of trying to help people um, debug OpenMP programs or, or fix problems. So uh, I hope I hope that they will be helpful and that, that they will save you some 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 problems at some point in the future. Okay, so let's just start by talking about directives. So um, the feature that uh, that allows uh, directives to be ignored if if uh, if OpenMP is not switched on the compiler uh, does have a downside uh, and that is that mistyping the sentinel so if you in Fortran if you if you uh, type exclamation mark dollar OMP uh, so if instead of that you start you type exclamation mark OMP or for example in C if you type hash pragma OPM then that will raise no error message. The compiler is perfectly happily going to ignore uh, lines like that. Um, so be careful. Um, Say so a lot of the time, the worst the worst that can happen is that you just don't get any parallelism. Um, but the really bad thing can, really bad things can happen. So, for example, if it's uh, if it's an atomic then you will silently get a race condition, a potential race condition. Um, so if you know that you are prone to certain typos like that, then it's perhaps worth writing a little script that searches your code that you've written um, for, the, for, the, for the common typos that you make. Uh, just to make sure that you pick them up, because that's essentially that's about uh, other than just eyeballing the code. That's that's the only way you're going to pick them up, because the compiler isn't going to object at all to doing this kind of thing. So while we're on the topic of of uh, writing code that works without OpenMP as well, um, one one handy feature is that the the macro underscore OpenMP is defined if your code is compiled with the OpenMP switch in the compiler. So you can use this as a portable way to conditionally compile code so that it works with and without OpenMP enabled. So as I said before, the, the, uh, the way the directory is structured do half the job for you. Um, the problem comes where if you have um, calls to the runtime library, so calls to OMP get num threads, for example, OMP get thread num, uh, and you want to conditionally compile that so that your code still works without OpenMP, then you can use this macro um, as uh, in an if def for the preprocessor. Um, alternatively, though, I don't think people really do this very much. Um, you could link dummy OpenMP library routines into your sequential code. Um, there is actually uh, code in the standard that you can copy, um, which will act as a, a as a dummy, a dummy library and will uh, return sensible values if you uh, call if your if your whole program is just running on one thread. Okay, so this is. Getting a little bit into uh, performance issues, which I'm going to cover in much more depth in the uh, in the second talk this afternoon. Um, but so just to be aware that uh, that you know, executing a parallel region does come with some overhead, uh, and that's typically in the sort of tens of microseconds range. So uh, that. That's a sort of rough figure. The exact numbers will depend on which compiler you're using, what hardware you're using, uh, and the number of threads. Um, but the message here is that you, know, the, you can't successfully parallelize very short blocks of code. So the sequential execution of a, of a section 
sequen sequential execution time of a section of a code has to be several times that uh, that that overhead to make it worthwhile parallelizing. Sometimes you can be in a situation where uh, a code section is only sometimes long enough. So you might encounter this piece of code many times during the execution of a program. Sometimes it's going to be long enough to be worth parallelizing, and other times it might not be. Uh, if you're in that situation, then you can use the if clause on the parallel region to decide at runtime whether you're going to go parallel or not for that particular instance of the parallel region. Um, so there is still some overhead uh, if you execute a parallel region on, on one thread, but it's typically much smaller, so much less than a microsecond. So may, maybe on the order of a tenth of a microsecond. So there is still some overhead, but it's probably a couple of orders of magnitude smaller on one thread than it is on two or more threads. Um, so I'll just put a plug in for some uh, benchmark code, which I, I wrote a long time ago and is, uh, is uh, still used quite a lot by compiler vendors to check the performance of their OpenMP implementations. Um, so you can use these to measure the overheads of things like parallel regions and various other parallel constructs in OpenMP on, on whatever system that you're running on to give you a feel for uh, how much work you need to in order to be able to be worth worthwhile going parallel. Okay, so um, a lot of the time we are looking at parallelizing loops, and obviously we have to face the question: you know, is is my loop parallelizable? Um, so. One of the questions you have to ask is, is are, are the iterations of the loop actually independent? Um, and one test you can do to, to check this is to, is, to, is to run the loop in reverse order okay, in your sequential code. Uh, and if you still get the same answers, then the chances are that, yes, you do indeed have independent iterations. So, Given that the cost of synchronizing threads is reasonably expensive, so um, sometimes we're in a situation where we might have a parallel region with multiple uh, parallel loops in it, uh, and the question then arises is when is it safe to suppress the barrier between loops? So when can we how can when can we assume in a situation like this where we have two loops of the same length? Okay, so both loops are 4i equals 0, i less than n. Uh, the first loop writes values to ai, and the second loop reads values uh, from ai. So the question is, is it safe to use the no weight which will remove the barrier at the end of the first loop? And the answer is, um, it's safe as long as the, the number of iterations in the two loops are the same and that this, the schedule is static. Now that can be with or without specifying a chunk size. So as long as you have a static schedule then you, and the same number of iterations, then you're guaranteed that the both loops will get the same mapping of iterations to threads. Uh, and therefore that the write of A and the subsequent read of A will happen on the same thread. So there's no need to synchronize between these two loops. This is just something to note um, that uh, comes with a bit of surprise to people. Uh, actually, the, uh, the default schedule for, for loops, if we don't have a schedule clause, is actually implementation defined and it doesn't have to be static. Um, in practice, it is in all the implementations that I know of. Um, so, but nevertheless, it's, it's probably not a good idea to rely on this. 
And you should also note that, that specifying schedule static does not completely specify the distribution of loop iterations because there are different possibilities for how the uh, any remainder is, is dealt with if the number of threads doesn't exactly divide the number of iterations. Um, so, but the, 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 only, the only thing to be aware of here is, is not to write code that, that relies on a particular mapping of iterations to threads. Um, and that's usually okay uh, because we also want to write code that doesn't rely on a particular number of threads either. Um, so that's uh, that's usually not not a not a great problem. When we do have loops that are not well balanced and we want to use some schedule which isn't static, so maybe static with a chunk size or dynamic or possibly guided, but really static with a chunk size or dynamic, then um, tuning the chunk size can be quite tricky. And the problem is that the optimal chunk size can depend quite strongly on the number of threads. So you know, if you find the uh, a good chunk size for a particular number of threads, then that may not be the best chunk size if you either increase or decrease the number of threads. So actually, it turns out it's often more robust to instead of tuning the chunk size, what we actually tune is the number of chunks per thread. So that's the parameter we're going to tune. And then we can compute the chunk size from that at runtime when we actually know the number of threads that we're going to have. Uh, and that's because we can do this because the chunk size expression in the schedule clause uh, doesn't have to be a, a compile time constant. It can be uh, an expression. So it can, have, it can be a variable, for example. So that's a, that's a more robust way to, to tune your load imbalance loops is to, uh, is to try and fix the number of chunks per thread rather than the chunk size itself. So if you're in a situation where you want the behavior where you're inside a parallel region and you want only one thread to execute something, then we have these two choices. We can either use single or master. Um, so both of these constructs cause you know, a code block to be executed by one thread only while the others skip it. So, so which should you use? Um, well, in principle, master have, has lower overhead because it's just a test on the thread number. A single requires some synchronization in order, that the, in order to detect which thread got there first. However, you need to remember that this is this, this asymmetry in that uh, master does not have an implied barrier. So if you want one, you have to add an explicit barrier directive, whereas single has an implied barrier. And if you don't want it, then you can suppress it with the no way. Um, if you do expect some threads to arrive before others, if you know that there's some, some load imbalance or some good reason why, uh, why, why some threads are likely to get to this point before others, then it probably makes sense to use single so that this block can be started as soon as possible uh, without having to wait for, for, say, the master thread to arrive. Um, I was going to think about data sharing attributes for a bit now. So don't forget that private variables are uninitialized on entry to parallel regions. That's quite a common source of bugs. Um, so you can use first private to initialize private variables with the value that existed uh, in that variable at the start of the parallel region or when the master thread encountered the parallel directive, um, to be more correct. Um, but it's more likely to be an error. Okay, so the real use cases are um, for first private are, are rare. So um, if you find yourself in this situation, then just have a, have a think about what's going on. Um, so it's more likely that you actually do want to initialize your private variables inside the, private, inside the parallel region rather than use first private. OK. Um, so uh, I did mention this point when we were talking about shared and private variables. 
um, but it's uh, it's I think this is so important that I'm going to make the point again here. So just remember that the default behavior for parallel regions and work sharing constructs and task constructs as well is essentially default shared. Okay. So um, that's very dangerous. Um, it makes it far too easy uh, to accidentally share variables. And this is probably the worst design decision ever made uh, at the beginning of, of, of OpenMP. And to make to make the default behavior for any variable that you don't specify in a in a in a in a clause to to be shared. So my advice is always always use default none and explicitly declare all the variables that appear inside the parallel region. Um, why why do I make this point so forcefully? Uh, I've seen it happen so many times that people make mistakes. Uh, and what happens is that it's, um, there's, an, there's the effect that I call variable blindness. Okay? So if you ask somebody to look through a piece of code, even a fairly simple piece of code, uh, and, ex and list all the variables that are used, they will typically miss some. Um, so relying on default behavior is extremely dangerous because the consequences are so bad that you get race conditions and non-deterministic behavior. So I, I just can't emphasize this as uh, 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 enough as, as good practice. Um, I mean, so if you, find, if you do find yourself Having a very long, having very long list of variables in clauses, then you know by all means, once you've tested your program sufficiently, then you can you know then you can replace um, with uh, with default shared or default private. But uh, initially, I would always use default. For, force yourself to think about every variable that's being used, uh, whether it should be shared or private or or reduction or first private. Uh, and uh, and don't cut corners like this. It'll, I, you know, I, I, I guarantee that you, you know, this will this will save you several days of your life uh, tracking down nasty nasty race condition bugs. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this this doesn't really work quite so well in a, a, a in a non-interactive setting, <laughs> but um, anyway, okay. So I have a. If you have, have a quick look at this piece of code uh, and see, see if you can spot the bug. Okay, uh, so the answer is that, uh, that, that J, the variable J here is shared by default and it shouldn't be. Okay. Uh, you know, old fashioned style C where uh, I'm not declaring the loop iterators uh, in the scope of the loop, so they're 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 declared somewhere outside the parallel region. Uh, the the, the uh, default behavior for everything except the parallel loop iterator is is shared. So in particular, uh, J is is shared here. Uh, and this is this one's particularly nasty because. Uh, what can happen is that if you have sufficient compiler optimization turned on, you will never see the bug. So uh, you can, because uh, what, what, what typically happens is that the, once the compiler has compiled code with, with optimization turned on, that the, the value of J is never actually stored in memory. Uh, what actually happens is that there will be some register which is initialized with the loop count, uh, and that's decremented by one every time the, the loop body executes. And the, value, the actual value of J is never actually stored anywhere. So what's effectively going on here is the compiler is, is doing the privatization for you by, by storing J in a register. But as soon, you know, the moment that you give the code to somebody else and they they compile it without optimization, then the race condition may appear. 
Okay, so this is a slightly weird one. Um, so what's going on here in this code is, so uh, on, on the left hand side here, I have a parallel region and I have a variable called foo, which is a global variable. Okay, so it's a, a, a file scope variable in C. So it's declared outside of, of, the, uh, of any routine. Uh, and then I make it private on the parallel region. So inside the parallel region, uh, on the left-hand side here, that reference to foo is to, the, is to the private copy and not to the original global variable. Question is now, what happens if I call a function, so this is some func here, inside the parallel region, and so the code for so that's on the right hand side here. So this code references that global variable. So the question is, is that reference to foo inside the function call to the private copy made, made by the parallel region or is it to the original shared global location? Uh, and the answer is you don't know. <laughs> Um, so it's un this, is, this is not specified. Uh, this, this is deliberately left vague by the standard as to whether that reference is to the original storage or the private copy. Uh, and different compilers will do different things here. Uh, and so the downs the uh, the upshot of that is that essentially this is unportable because you don't know what's going to happen if you move this kind of code from one compiler to another, uh, and therefore you really can't do it. Okay. So if you if you really do want to access the private copy, then you need to pass it through the argument list or or use thread private to get private copies of global variables. So basically this pattern is is unusable because you don't know whether which you don't know what foo it actually refers to uh, on the right hand side here. Um, so I don't know how many of you are Fortran programmers, um, but this uh, this kind of problem might hit you if you are asked to go and add OpenMP to uh, you know, some old-fashioned style Fortran. So you know you can pe people used to. Uh, I'm I'm sure none of you would do this uh, these days, but in in the past, people used to write code like this. You know they they would have a loop. Uh, which had essentially, um, you know, several pages of uh, of code, maybe you know, several hundred lines of code inside the loop. Uh, so not in a function call, just directly inside the loop, which might reference a uh, hundred or more variables. So then you're faced with the problem of determining the correct scope, whether you know, for all those variables, whether they're private or shared or reduction. Uh, and that's you know, that that's tedious, error prone, uh, and it's difficult to test properly because you're you're testing for non essentially you, again in this problem of have, trying to test for non-deterministic behavior, which might might never happen in your in your particular test environment. So if you are faced with the situation, then the, the thing to do is to refactor your sequential code to wrap the body of the loop inside a subroutine. So then what you can do is then you, uh, as part of that sequential refactoring, you make all the loop temporary variables local variables inside that subroutine. And everything else you pass through the argument list. So that refactoring is is much easier to test for correctness because it's just a, it's a sequential change. So anything you do here is a, is a deterministic test. Um, then you can go and parallelize that with the advantage that all those temporary variables declared inside the subroutine body are, are now private by default and you don't have to care about. So in C++, you tend not to face this this problem so much, um, but you know you can you can solve it as in a in a slightly different way by declaring temporaries in the scope of the loop body. So again, you can uh, you can if you if you have a variable which you only which really is only 
only uh, scoped inside the loop body by declaring it inside the inside the loop body and therefore inside the parallel region makes it private by default. So there are fewer things that you have to care about whether they are in the in the in the shared or private clause lists. So this is a, a a pattern that comes up with reductions sometimes and you need to be aware of because there's a subtle hidden race condition here. So what I have is I have a um, uh, a parallel region and inside the parallel region I have a parallel loop which has a reduction variable on it. So the loop forms the sum of uh, of the vector in the B. Uh, so I'm I need to declare uh, sum as a reduction variable, and I need that on the for loop because I want the I, I I'm going to use the value uh, of sum that comes out of the loop uh, in the remainder of the parallel region. So it's not good enough to put the reduction clause on the parallel region because then the sum doesn't get formed until too late. So I need to initialize the the uh, the value of sum, uh, and here I have it inside done inside the parallel region. And the problem here is that I've been careless, and that initialize because because uh, I'm in a parallel region and not inside a work sharing construct. That initialization of sum is being executed by every thread. So it looks harmless, um, but technically it's a race condition. So what can actually happen is that uh, that one thread initializes sum to zero. It goes all the way through the iterations of the loop, adds its partial result into the original storage for sum, and then sometime later, one of the other threads sets back to zero again. So this this is a, this is there's a potential race between initializing sum and the updates, the implicit updates that occur as part of the reduction at the end of the parallel loop. So this is unsafe. So you need to make sure that the initialization is done by one thread only and that there's some synchronization between the initialization and the execution of the loop because there is the threads do not synchronize on entry to the work sharing loop you need to put an explicit barrier there to make sure that the initialization has been done before any threads start executing loop iterations so this is something that sometimes happens to people and puts them right off using openmp okay? so the first thing that they do they take a sequential code and they add the OpenMP compiler flag, build their code, uh, and then they discover that their code's been broken, or their code doesn't work anymore. So that kind of, that's kind of off-putting. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this might happen. Okay. Um, one is that you have a bug in your code, which is assuming that the contents of a local variable are preserved between function calls. So in other words, you have a, uh, a missing save statement in Fortran or a missing static declaration in, in C or C++. Is what happens when you compile with the OpenMP flag, that forces all local variables to be stack allocated and not heap allocated. That's so that they would be correctly privatized if if the function that they belong to was ever called from inside a parallel region. Another side effect of that is even if you don't have a bug, then this uh, this forcing of all local variables to go on the stack may cause stack overflow to happen. Um, because for, uh, for sequential compilation, the compiler has the choice. So particularly for if you have locally declared arrays inside functions, then the compiler will make a choice whether to stack allocate that or heap allocate that storage. By turning on the uh, OpenMP flag, you're forcing it to do stack allocation, uh, 
therefore you you you'll then add your your stacks get bigger and you you might end up running out of stacks so you do need to use save or static correctly but those variables are then shared by default um, so you might then mean uh, that might not be what you want so you might need to make them thread private uh, so one of the problems you do tend to come across here is, or one one use, common use case for these things is first time through code. Okay? So uh, some people write this pattern where essentially you have a, a flag, and so the first um, it's initially unset. Uh, the first time a function ever gets called, some piece of code gets executed. You then set the flag, uh, and that that that's either a, a save or static flag and so that piece of code that piece of code never subsequently gets executed on any other call um, so that kind of thing that kind of pattern may need refactoring um, if the first call happens and it's going to happen inside a parallel region uh, because then you have to resolve the the race condition somehow okay so the you know, the notion of the first ex the uh, the notion of the first execution isn't isn't then may not then be well defined so you might have to change code so that you know that that first time through code will be executed before you ever get to the first parallel region. OK, so while we're on the topic of stack size, um, so if, it, if you have large private data structures, then it's possible to run out of stack space. Uh, and the way that stack space is controlled for OpenMP programs is slightly complicated. Um, so the way it works is that the size of thread stacks apart from the master thread, so every other thread apart from the master thread, can be controlled using an environment variable called OMP stack size. So you need to set that. You may need to set that variable to to get more stack size than than the default. The size of the master thread stack is controlled as, in the same way as, as it would be for a sequential program. So this is with a compiler switch or on, for example, on Linux systems using the ulimit command. Um, or there are other possible ways that it might might be done. So whatever way on your particular uh, system you would normally set the stack size for a sequential program you need to do it that way so you may need to do both these things which is slightly inconvenient um, the reason that uh, that openmp can't control the uh, the stack size for the master thread as because the, the way that you it's really down to the way that unix processes work it's because the by the time the OpenMP runtime gets invoked, it's too late. The, stacks, the, uh, the operating system has already set the stack size, uh, and it can't be modified. OK, so one, two bits and pieces about synchronization. Uh, just remember that you can't protect updates to shared variables in one place with atomic and in another place with, with critical if they might happen at the same time. Uh, so there's no mutual exclusion between those. So this code fragment, we have a parallel region. So I have uh, uh, two updates to A, one of which is protected by a critical, uh, one of which is protected by atomic. So that's not safe. I, I still have a race condition here. Something you might find yourself wanting to do at some point is to allocate some storage based on the number of threads. Um, so in particular, you might want to allocate some storage whose size is, you know, allocates the size is determined by the number of threads, but you want to allocate the storage before the parallel region starts um, and, and say, so, that, so for example, that you can make it shared between all the threads. Um, but the question is, how do you know how many threads the next parallel region is going to use? Uh, because you can't call OMP get num threads before the parallel region, because that's just going to return one. That always returns one in the sequential part of the program. However, there is a way out. There is another function you could call here, which is which is OMP get max threads. Um, uh, what that does is it returns the value of what's of of, of one of OpenMP's what what OpenMP calls internal control variables. 
and essentially but what that is is that's that's an internal piece of state an internal variable which says for this given thread how many threads will the next parallel region that it, it encounters use um and so you can guarantee that the so OMP, what OMP get max threads returns is the value of this thing and you know that the number of threads used for the next parallel region encountered by this thread will not exceed that unless you use a num threads clause um, so it's worth remembering particularly for writing um, production code or li particularly library code then it's always possible that the implementation will deliver you fewer threads than than what you asked for um, so as i say is it it's best as far as possible to write code that does not depend on there actually being a certain number of threads but if you do do that you should always call omp get num threads inside the power region to check that you actually got the number of threads that you expected OpenMP is designed to be used in a variety of situations, you know, including on you know, um, multi-user server systems where you might have you know, more than one application running at the same time, or on your, you know, on your on your desktop or laptop where you have other applications running on the hardware. In High performance computing world, then typically we're not in that situation. It's particularly if we're running uh, code as a batch job, then we normally have exclusive access to uh, a node or a set of nodes. Um, and what this means, the, 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 the way that OpenMP is designed is that it you know, is very flexible in, in, in this kind of situation it's going to be used in. So the default behavior with respect to um, uh, making, uh, making best use of or you know, um, using the hardware to the fullest extent may not be the default behavior. Okay? So there are, what, what this means that is if you, if, you are, if you do have um, dedicated access to your hardware, then there's some environment variables that you should set to maximize performance. Um, which may or may not be the default. Um, so uh, there are three of these. So the first one is, is OMP wait policy, and you should set that to active. And what that does, that, it, it, that encourages idle threads to spin rather than go to sleep. So if you have threads, say, waiting at a barrier or waiting to enter a critical region, then the runtime has the op has the option of either keeping those threads alive and consuming CPU cycles, so that they're immediately ready to start up again uh, as soon as as soon as possible, or it can decide to put them to sleep, so that that frees up hardware resources for other the system to use. Um, so setting wait policy equals active uh, encourages the runtime to, to 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 do spinning rather than sleeping. Uh, which means that starting up, starting the threads up again will be as fast as possible. Uh, the next one is OMP dynamic. Uh, so you should set that to false. So that encourages the runtime not to deliver fewer threads than, than what you asked for. If you set OMP dynamic equals true, or if that's the default behavior, then runtime will typically look at the, the load on the, on the hardware uh, and make a decision about how many threads to give you based on the load. Um, you don't want it to do that, typically. If you've got dedicated resources, you really want it to give you the number of threads that you asked for. And the third one is OMP proc bind equals true. So what that does is that it binds threads, it, or it encourages the runtime to bind threads to cores and prevent threads from swapping between cores while your code's running. Um, so that's, um, that's undesirable behavior because the cost of moving a thread and the subsequent cost of having that thread's data in the wrong cache uh, is, uh, is damaging to performance. So essentially what you want to try and do here is encourage the runtime to, uh, to bind 
threads to to cores and and leave them there until the program's finished. Okay, um, so I'm going towards the end of this now. So uh, think about a bit about tools. So you know traditional debuggers, such as you know even plain old ones like GDB, but um, you know more sophisticated GUI things like DDT or Total View that you might come across. Uh, on HPC systems do have support for OpenMP. Um, so that's good, but they're not really that much help for tracking down race conditions and non-deterministic behavior. Because what tends to happen is that running under the debugger changes the timing of events that happen on different threads. So that can just make the rate race condition go away. Um, and the same is true of adding print statements as well. So, uh, you know, even if you're just doing a good old fashioned printf debugging, then that doesn't, that may not help you very much for race conditions because the, uh, the actual cost of printing uh, stuff out is actually quite high. And that's also going to change the, uh, the relative timing of events in different threads. That might, might, might just make your race condition go away. Um, so there are some race detection tools uh, available which work in a, in a different way. So what they do is uh, they capture all the memory accesses that happen during a run of your program. Uh, and then that data is then analyzed afterwards for races that might have occurred. Okay, so it looks for, it looks for problems that might have happened, um, not just ones that did happen. Um, so the main tool that does this is uh, it comes from Intel. It's called Intel Inspector. Um, there's also another. There's also another one which was uh, used to be produced by Sun but until they got taken over by Oracle. But I, I believe that's now defunct. Okay, so you, uh, I don't think you can get hold of that anymore. So the main one is is Intel Inspector, um, and. Intel changes its licensing policy every five minutes, as far as I can tell. But uh, at the moment, I think if you are a student or an educator or an open source code developer, then you qualify for a free license for, for Inspector. Uh, and lastly, a word about timers. Right? If, uh, if you are timing code, then you really need to make sure that your timer is actually measuring war clock time. So, uh, so I'd encourage you do use the OpenMP timer, OMP get W time, um, but don't, for example, use clock in C or CPU time in Fortran. What they do is something really quite different. They measure the CPU time, but that's accumulated across all the threads. So although for a sequential program, uh, real world time, uh, CPU time may be quite closely related, for multi-threaded programs, they're not. So the real world time can be much shorter than the, than the accumulated CPU time across all the threads. What happens if it's uh, a very common thing is what people use uh, uh, the wrong one by mistake. They use clock or CPU time. Uh, and what they observe is that their OpenMP programs don't appear to give any speed up. Okay, in fact, they probably appear to be slowing down a bit, um, and that's because you're measuring accumulated CPU time across all threads and not not the actual wall clock time. So, so that's one to watch out for. Okay, and um, so that's that's the end of, uh, of of this talk. Does anybody have questions? So the question is, can you make private data structures heap allocated? Um, so yes, is the answer. There are various ways of doing that. So if you, uh, if you, for example, if you declare a private pointer uh, and then uh, allocate memory to that pointer, then that will be private. Okay, so that's a private data structure that's, that's heap allocated. Um, the other way you can do it is that if you have local variables, then you can actually, if you want them heap allocated and it's safe to do so, and you and you don't and you don't mind that they're shared, then you can declare them as as, as static or save. 
but normally what you would do is uh, is do the allocation inside the parallel region. So that could be that applies to Fortran as well. You can uh, you can allocate uh, arrays. So you can declare an allocatable array outside a parallel region, um, make it private. Uh, then every thread gets a copy, and you can actually do the allocation inside the private region, so, so that every thread allocates its own uh, its own heap heap allocated data structures. Okay. So the question is: is so any variable declared declared inside a parallel region is 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 heap allocated? Um, no okay and the, so if you declare just declaring a variable inside a parallel region will make it um, will, will typically be stack allocated okay so the actual so what you what you have is uh, so the actual variable you declare is 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 stack allocated so that's the mechanism by which it becomes private to a thread but you can uh, say say you can for example uh, have a pointer which is a private to a thread so every thread has its own copy of the pointer each thread can then uh, malloc re to that pointer so every thread would have its own piece of heap allocated storage the follow-up question is can, can i make the copies myself and pass pointers to threads yes sure you can do that so you could um you you could say you could uh, you could malloc a large piece of of, of memory outside um, the um, parallel region. You could set up an say an array of pointers into different pieces of that uh, of that storage, uh, and then you could uh, pass that as a shared data structure into your parallel region, and then allow each thread to use a different pointer. Into a into a global into a, a a shared piece of memory. So that's also, yep, that's entirely possible. Okay, great. So if you do have a particular example in mind, it might be easier to uh, uh, to post it to the chat page and uh, can uh, can talk about a uh, you know a specific use case there if that would be helpful. Um, Fine, great. So uh, we'll take a break now and I'll come back at, at 3.30 and talk about performance issues. Uh, um, see you later. Okay, great. Hello again, everybody. Um, so time for, time for the last lecture in this course, which is about performance issues. So Hope I've convinced you that it's you know although you know there are some subtleties and parallel programming is by its nature difficult. Um, you know, writing OpenMP programs and and getting them correct is uh, is not is not too daunting a prospect. What what quite often happens is that then uh, getting something that performs well is 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 another story. And um, so that's so that's what I want to focus on now. Um, so I guess you know this is uh, a little bit of a joke, but uh, you know this is you know maybe a common scenario. So you know, you, and I think it happens. It's probably experienced quite a lot by people who are starting out with OpenMP. Um, so you write your first OpenMP program, and you're happy with it. It gives you the right answers, and then you ran some timing tests, and you see that the speed up well was frankly a bit disappointing. Okay, now what do you do? Um, so uh, so most of us have probably been there or you know are about to get to this point and um, the question is where did your performance go and the way I like to think about it is that it, it disappeared into, into overheads of some sort okay. um, so the way I like to think about it is that there are a collection of different possible sources of overhead which can cause poor performance in OpenMP programs. Um, uh, and, and I call these the, the six and a half evils. So there are, there are essentially six main sources of, of, of overhead. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each of these, each of these in turn. Uh, so these are sequential code, idle threads, synchronization, scheduling, communication, and hardware resource contention. 
What's the half? Well, the half is another minor one, which is compiler non-optimization, which I'll mention briefly at the end. So it's it's uh, it's not often a problem, but it's uh, it's useful just be just to be aware that it could possibly happen to you. So let's take a, a look at, at at these in term and discuss ways of ways of avoiding them or reducing them. So sequential code is relatively simple to, to think about. So in OpenMP, all the code that's outside the parallel regions or inside master or single directives is essentially sequential code. And the time spent in the sequential code will limit performance. That's just a statement of, of, of Amdahl's law. So to make that concrete, so for example, if 20% of the original execution time is not parallelized, I'm never going to get more than five times speed up my code. Because okay, I'm not, you know, no matter how fast the 80% goes, then that 20% is always going to take the same amount of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm limited to the amount of speed up I can get. So if that's the problem we've got, then we need to find, essentially, we haven't finished the job. We need to find ways of parallelizing more of the code that accounts for that. Uh, portion of the execution time that's still in the sequential part of the part of the program. OK, so next up is idle threads. So this type of overhead happens when some threads finish a piece of computation before others and have to wait for the others to catch up. So the typical situation we have here is where threads are sitting idle in a barrier. So this could be at maybe at the end of the parallel loop or end of a parallel region. So what this uh, diagram is supposed to be illustrate is, um, so I have sort of time flowing from, from left to right here, and I have, I'm showing the, the status of, of, of four threads executing, say, a parallel region. And the blue piece is supposed to represent uh, the threads doing useful work. And the red piece is where they are having to wait. Okay. So you'll see that the, uh, the blue section is on the third thread. And the other three threads have to wait at the barrier for the third thread to arrive. So they finished their computation earlier. So they so enter this red state, which is where they're sitting waiting for the uh, waiting for the third thread to finish its work uh, and that's essentially idle thread time so that's that's a source of overhead and a source of a potential source of poor speed up okay uh, so what can we do to avoid avoid load imbalance like this well if it's a parallel loop then we can experiment with the different schedule kinds and chunk sizes um, so there's a convenience this convenience mechanism here where we can use schedule runtime to avoid recompilation. So that's so if you specify schedule runtime on a parallel loop, then you can set the uh, schedule and the chunk size through the environment variable OMP schedule. Um, so that allows you a way of, of experimenting. So you can script your experiments without having to recompile your code. For more regular computations, uh, using tasks can be helpful instead of trying to do everything with parallel loops, because uh, the runtime then takes care of the load balancing for you. So as long as you generate sufficient tasks uh, and they're not too small, then you have a good chance that the, the, the runtime will sort out the load balancing. Just as a society, it's uh, useful to keep in mind that it's not always safe to assume that two threads doing the same number of computations will actually take the same amount of time. So we tend to assume this, that if you know, if two threads are executing the same of code uh, or going through a loop the same number of times, then that's going to actually result in the same execution time. That may not be true um, because, for example, the time taken to load and store data in two different threads may be different depending on if or whether or where that data happens to be cached. So um, the, the, the memory system uh, can affect the performance 
uh, as well as just counting the number of instructions that are being executed by each thread. So you might, might two threads might execute the same number of instructions, but one thread may, for example, have more cache misses than the other thread and therefore take longer. Uh, and that's a potential source of load imbalance, even though if you look at the code, it, it appears that the threads are doing the same thing. Another place that threads can be idle is if they're waiting to access a critical section. So in OpenMP, this will be critical regions or atomics or lock routines. So in this timeline, what I've shown is that there is this uh, green stripy piece of code, which is a critical section which only one thread at a time can execute. So, if, uh, so if what happens here, they are all threads are executing useful work. So that's the, the, the blue region at the left hand side. Then they all encounter this critical section and they have to take it in turns to execute it. So the, uh, the second, third, and fourth threads have to wait their turn. So they all have some, some red idle time waiting to get into the critical section. So in this question, it's, uh, it's usually a question of this is if this type of overhead is a problem. It's usually trying to you know, try to avoid waiting. So minimize the time spent in the critical section. So only have the code in the criti critical section that absolutely must be protected. So move other things out of the critical section. Um, so just remember that OpenMP critical regions are effectively using a global lock. Um, you do have this ability to use critical directives with different names to protect different data structures. Um, otherwise, you should always use atomics if possible, because that's, a, that's more efficient, allows more optimization. So it allows the possibility of, for example, which we talked about, is the ability for concurrent updates to different array elements to happen. Or if you're really stuck, you might need, you know, if atomics aren't applicable because you're not working with basic types, or you have some more complicated up, update pattern, uh, you can use locks, but then you might, instead of using a single global lock, you may be able to use multiple locks to protect multiple different data structures independently. So next possible source of overhead is synchronization. So every time we synchronize threads, there is some overhead, even if the threads are never idle. So that's because uh, somehow the, the threads must communicate to each other that, that they've arrived at a, at a given point in, in the program, or that, you know, that the, the lock that's, that's, uh, uh, that uh, a thread is waiting for has, uh, has been set. So that some, some low-level communication has to be going on uh, in order to make this work. So OpenMP, uh, the way OpenMP designed is that it, it, it kind of encourages this coding style, which is full of implicit barriers. So every time you end a parallel region or end a parallel loop, there's an implicit barrier. And barriers can be quite expensive. So as I said in the last lecture, it's you know it's uh, you know tens of microseconds. So that translates to you know hundreds or ten, sorry, thousands or tens of thousands of uh, of CPU clock cycles. So that's you know that's uh, that's not not particularly cheap, um, and you know criticals, atomics, and locks are not free either. So every time you enter or exit a critical uh, a critical section, there there is some some cost in doing that. Um, I say atomics should be cheaper, but you know they're still not completely free. Uh, and also, if we use tasks, then you know creating or executing a task is uh, is, is not free either. So what are some of the things we can do to avoid synchronization overheads? So what typically happens is, if uh, particularly if we're working with legacy code, we tend to go looking for the loops where most of the execution time is. And what tip, what's typically the easiest thing to do is to parallelize the innermost loops because these you know these are easy, easiest to easiest to analyze they probably they might not need any any refactoring you can just add a parallel do or parallel for directive and get something working um, but 
that might mean that you have an awful lot of barriers and there isn't that much computation going on between them. So you need to think about parallelizing at the outermost level possible uh, to minimize frequency of barriers. So that might require some refactoring the code. So it might, for example, require reordering of loops uh, and by by extension also reordering some of your data structures so that you so that you don't damage the, the cache behavior. Uh, if you have multiple loops inside a parallel region, then we can think about using no wait clauses to suppress some of those implicit barriers. But you really have to be careful. Um, it's easy to introduce race conditions by removing barriers that are actually required for correctness. So you have to really think quite carefully about whether there are any, whether those barriers really are uh, breaking any dependencies and are really necessary, or whether they really, or whether the computations really are independent and and, and the barriers can be got rid of. Okay, and again, just to emphasise that. Uh, you know, atomics typically are, are lower overhead than critical or locks. Um, it's not guaranteed that's a quality of implementation problem, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's generally speaking a, a reasonable assumption in, in, in modern, uh, uh, modern implementations of OpenMP that, that atomics are going to work reasonably well. Okay, so next topic is scheduling. So this is also a potential source of overhead. Essentially, what the idea here is that if we create computational tasks and we rely on the runtime to assign these to threads, then we're going to incur some overhead. So that process of assignment um, is going to cost something. Some of that may actually be internal synchronization inside the runtime, but there's also going to be some other bookkeeping code going on uh, while the runtime you know, figures out which thread does what and in what order. The sort of places where where this uh, can be a problem is if you have uh, non-static loop schedules. So if you use uh, dynamic or guided loop schedules, there's some scheduling overhead in there, and also with tasks as well. So I have an example like this. You know, so if I have a uh, uh, a loop with a lot of iterations, and uh, which maybe you know every every iteration doesn't do very much computation. Uh, and I parallelize it and I use a, a, a dynamic schedule with a chunk size of one. So that means I'm creating essentially uh, a, an awful lot of tiny, tiny computational tasks which have to be scheduled by the runtime. Um, so that may not pan out very well. You may just, may just drown in overheads. Um, and so it's often a question of getting the granularity of the task right. You know? So if we have, uh, if, if, if the tasks are too big, then we might not have enough of them. Uh, and that might result in us having idle threads because there, are, you know, there, isn't, there aren't enough tasks to allow the load to be balanced. Uh, if the tasks are too small, then we might balance the load well, but we might end up having lots of overheads due to scheduling. So it's, uh, this is often a, a uh, a decision that you have, we essentially have to make at the application level as to you know, what, what units of computation are we going to designate at tasks so that we have enough to get load balance, but not so many to, to drown in scheduling overheads. OK, so my, my next evil is communication. Say, so, well, really, is communication going on? And the answer is yes, OK. Um, but it's happening in a in a rather subtle and indirect way because uh, on on shared memory systems, essentially what happens is that uh, communicating data between threads uh, is is disguised as increased memory access costs because it takes longer to access uh, data that's in main memory or data that's in another processor's cache than it does to get it from the local cache where the thread is currently executing. Uh, I have to remember that memory access is a relatively expensive, you know, so for on um, on modern hardware, you know, we're, we're talking about order of 100 clock cycles to retrieve data from main memory, uh, you know, compared to a handful of cycles to do a. So you know, memory accesses are, are relatively expensive things. 
Um, so communication between processes, uh, so between cores on a chip and between different chips in a, in a, in a multi-socket uh, system, takes place via the cache coherency mechanism. Uh, and the problem with this is that, you know, so this is very different from the situation we have in message passing code. So if, you've, if any of you have worked with MPI, um, this, this will make sense with that to you. Um, in shared memory programs, uh, in, open MP, in OpenMP programs um, specifically, the communication is very fine grained. So it consists of these, uh, you know, these memory accesses that cost more and they're spread throughout the program. Uh, in, in message passing programs, it's very easy to identify where the communication is happening. The only place it could be happening is essentially inside calls to the message passing library. Uh, and those things are relatively coarse grained and easy to, easy to see where they are. You can look at a message passing program and immediately see where communication is taking place. If you look at a multi-threaded program, it's really difficult. You cannot a priori decide whether a given look or store of a variable is going to be a cache hit or a cache miss. So that makes it much harder to analyze and it also makes it harder to monitor. It's difficult for, for tools to analyze communication patterns in, in shared memory systems because uh, the problem is that, again, it's the granularity. Uh, trying to instrument every load and store to main memory uh, comes with is possible, but it comes with such big overheads and slows your pro your application down so much uh, that it that it's not often not a really viable approach. Okay, so cache coherency is quite a complicated to topic. I could spend an entire hour talking about that. Um, but uh, so here's the one slide version. So cache coherency in a nutshell. So what happens is that you know, whenever a thread writes a data item, what will happen is it will get an exclusive copy of, of the data in its local cache. Okay. And then in order to keep caches coherent, so that means that you know, in order to prevent two different caches storing the same value, uh, sorry, storing different value for the same memory location, then all the, any other copies of that data item in other caches get invalidated. So to, to prevent them reading out of date values. So you know, once, once a, a piece of data has been written, subsequent accesses to that, to that data item by other threads must get the data from the exclusive copy. So that takes time because it requires moving data between caches. So as I said, that's a really highly simplified description of what's going on here. Uh, the real hardware is actually quite complicated um, and understanding the details is, uh, is, is interesting, but it's not really necessary for us to be able to, 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 to reason sensibly about how programs behave. So, so this kind of simple model is, is, is perfectly fine. You have to realize that every time a thread writes something, if another thread then wants that data, wants to read that data, or also wants to write that data, then essentially some communication has to happen and that, that there's a cost associated with that. So this brings us on to the idea about data, data affinity. So you know, data will be cached on the processes which are accessing it. Um, so that means that we have to, you know, for good performance, we need to reuse cached data as much as possible. Um, so you know, that's true for sequential programs, obviously, but uh, it's also you know, we have this extra dimension for multi-threaded programs. In the, so we need to write code with good data affinity. So what does that mean? It really means ensuring that the same thread accesses the same subset of program data as much as possible. So that we avoid uh, as much as possible the situation where we have different threads reading and writing the same data. Um, and it also, it also pays to try to make these, these subsets large contiguous chunks of data rather than having finely grained interleaved accesses by different threads. So it's also possible, <coughs> it's also, excuse me, 
It's also important to prevent threads migrating between cores while the code is running, because that also ruins the data affinity. So if, uh, if a thread moves from one core to another, it means all the data that, that it, it had stored in its local cache also has to move with it uh, the next time it gets accessed. So as, like, as uh, mentioned in the, in the previous talk, can use OMP proc bind equals true to, pre to prevent that happening. Um, so here's an example where, where, where data affinity might matter. So here we've got two parallel loops, and they both uh, access a two-dimensional array A here. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to concentrate on the second loop first. So you'll see that the, the parallel loop is, is over the I index. Uh, uh, but the J index, so the, the extent of the J loop depends on I because we have for J equals zero, J less than I in there, in the second loop nest. So that means that the, uh, the parallel loop, the I loop, isn't well balanced. The amount of work depends on the value of, of I. So we might do some experiments with uh, the schedule clause for that loop to determine a, a, good, um, a, a good value of the, uh, of the schedule kind and the chunk size. So suppose it turns out that we, uh, you know, in order to balance the load, it turns out that using uh, schedule uh, static 16 is, is a good option here. So that schedule implies a certain pattern of accesses in that loop to that array A. So if we go back and look at the first loop, so that's where those, uh, that's where the previous write to that array happened. Now, that loop happens to be well balanced because in that case, we have J equals zero, J less than N. So every I iteration has the same amount of work to do so you might look at that in isolation and you think, OK, that I don't need to do anything um, complicated to fix the load balance here. So I can just use schedule static. But the, because these two loops access the same data and they do it with a different pattern, what's going to happen is that those from access patterns for A will result in communicating the values of, of, of A between different threads. So what will happen is that when we come to the, the, the second loop, it's likely that a lot of those accesses to A will result in cache misses because the previous access to that data was in the first loop and it happened on a different thread. So here's another example uh, where the same kind of effect can, can occur. So, 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 have, um, so now I've got three loops. So the first loop and the third loop are the same. Okay? So that's two different executions of the same loop. Uh, so that's a parallel loop. And that loop at some point inside it reads values of, 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 uh, of A, okay? it reads AI. In between those parallel loops, we have a sequential loop which resets the values in, in A. So again, we may, you know, we may run, this, uh, we run this code and we may decide, OK, so the first and the third loops look expensive. So we're going to parallelize those. But the middle one isn't really OK. So the middle one doesn't account for very much of the execution time. We decide that we, we leave that one sequential. But, uh, but what, what, what can happen here is that you know, the first loop, the access is to A, means that copies of, of different parts of A will be spread across multiple caches where those threads are executing. The sequential code will require exclusive access to, the, to, to that data. So uh, this, the, the middle loop will cause A to get gathered all into one cache. So that's the one where the master thread is executing. It'll end up with exclusive copies of, of all the elements of A. And then we, when we come to the third loop, we have expensive accesses 
because uh, again because that that data is no longer cached um, where we, 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 we would like it to be which is uh, you know, close to the threads which are accessing data so fixes okay so let's go back to the previous case so the fix here for example would be to say okay recognize that uh, I have a particular I need a particular access pattern to a to balance the second loop therefore I will I will use the same access pattern to the first loop so in order to get better data affinity in this case what I could do was apply the schedule static 16 to both loops and in the second case what I could do here would be, okay, so maybe I would want to parallelize the middle loop as well as the two outer ones, or probably even better still, because you know, parallelizing that loop might incur some, some uh, synchronization overheads because of the, an extra parallel region. So even better would be, say, to fold those accesses into, uh, into either the first or the second loop, okay? So um, to basically merge two loops together or potentially, if possible, even maybe merge all three loops together, um, so that I keep that keep that data uh, always on the on accessed by the same thread and and in the same caches. So yes, yeah, so in the second example, yes. Yeah, so what we see is not only will the the second parallel region scale badly because of the additional cache misses, but the sequential code in the middle, the loop in the middle, will also take longer because that process of invalidating other other copies of, of the data that's being accessed also takes time. Um, so the the uh, the data the, uh, the result of this is that you may you may end up needing the parallelized code, which doesn't appear to take much time in the sequential program. So now we get on to some particularly nasty and subtle things. So the first of these is uh, so-called NUMA effects, which is particularly unpleasant. So this starts, this starts to be important to us. It is only important where we have multi-socket systems. Okay? Um, so these are quite common in uh, HPC clusters at the moment. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the supercomputers and clusters that you're likely to use uh, have dual socket nodes. So, so this effect does, does tend to happen. When we have a multi-system, the location of data in main memory becomes important. Okay? Uh, and OpenMP doesn't have any way of controlling this. So there's no way when, you know, when the program allocates some data, the operating system has to make some choice about which socket it's going to get allocated on. Uh, and there's no, there's no way to, in, in OpenMP to, to control that. Um, so unfortunately, a common default policy for the operating systems, and and, uh, and this is true of Linux, which is you know, kind of everywhere on on uh, on these systems these days, is to place data on the processor. So in other words, on the socket which first accesses it. So this is a so-called first touch policy. Um, so for OpenMP programs. Uh, this can actually be the worst possible thing that you can do because it's easy to write an OpenMP program where your, your data is initialized on the master thread. So all the initial accesses to all your data come from the same core and therefore the same socket. So all your data gets allocated on one node and none on the other one. And, and then having all threads, if you have threads executing on both sockets, all threads accessing the data on the same node becomes becomes a bottleneck. So what can you do about this? Okay. Well, in some operating systems, you have some options to control the, the, the data placement. So for example, in Linux, in Linux, you can use the, the, the NUMA CTL command to change the policy from first touch to say round robin, where pages just get allocated cyclically. So you may not get you may not get a particularly good distribution, but at least you will get your data uh, spread across all the sockets rather than allocated on, on all all your data allocated on one of them. The other thing you can do is use the first touch policy indirectly by parallelizing your data initialization. 
So that may not seem worthwhile at all in view of the, you know, it may, the, your data visualization may be totally insignificant in terms of the time that it takes as a proportion of the total execution time in your sequential code. Uh, so, you, you know, your, your data initialization may take, you know, a few fractions of, your of a second and your program is going to run for hours and hours. So why bother, uh, why bother paralyzing your data initialization? Um, so the answer is if you're running on multi-socket systems, that really does matter because the, uh, the first accesses to the data structures determine where that data is going to live for, for the entire rest of the execution of the program. Typically, though, it's you know it's just avoiding this worst case that's uh, that's important. You don't have to get the distribution exactly right. So you know, some distribution is usually much better than none at all, uh, and then you might then worry about okay, can I really decide you know which threads going to use which data and and very carefully place place data. So that's usually possible to do if we have regular data structures like you know, large multi-dimensional arrays then um, then it's of, it's often quite uh, quite easy to reason about parallelizing the data initialization if we have much more complicated and dynamic data structures so you know if our if our application is you know is building dynamic data structures like trees or graphs or uh, or, or things like that, or, or, or linked lists, then parallelizing your initialization gets much more difficult. The thing to remember if we are going to do this is that the allocation is done on, in units of operating system pages. So that's um, typically, uh, by default, that's you know, usually a, a few kilobytes, you know, four kilobytes, 16 kilobytes are, are common. Uh, OS page sizes. Um, so this may be a reason not to use large pages. So some systems give you the option of running with much larger page size, you know, order of megabytes. But if you do that, it might mean that your that uh, that distributing your your data gets harder because it's being uh, allocated in in much larger chunks. Okay. <laughs> Even more evil uh, and even more difficult to uh, to to do things about is uh, is false sharing. Now, thankfully, the uh, hardware designers have done a reasonable job here, and uh, modern processors suffer less badly from this than they used to in the past. But nevertheless, it can still be a problem, and the the problem here is that. The, um, the units of on data in which this cache coherency mechanism operates are, uh, are, are, are the block size in, in the caches. So that's typically like 64 or 128 bytes. And that, that's bigger than a word of data. So you know, your, 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 your program's data words are typically integers or pointers or floating points uh, values, which will be you know, four or eight bytes long. So what can happen is that if different threads write to neighboring words in memory that happen to be stored in the same cache block, then that can still cause cache invalidations even though logically there's no communication needed between threads. So you know, threads are not accessing the same data items. They're not logically sharing any data, but nevertheless, you can still get communication going on in the hardware to try and keep the, the caches uh, up to date. Uh, and it's, it's still a problem, even if we just have one thread writing and, and others read. So the worst cases and the ones that you should worry about is that, you know, is, is where you have different threads making really frequent writes to, to neighboring array elements. So that's, that's the most common pattern where, where this can happen. So, you know, for example, having a, um, having a shared array and indexing that with the thread number and doing lots of frequent updates to that, 
So for example, like counting something, counting something going on in your in your program can be can be really bad. Um, and you can also have it, uh, you can also have patterns where this can affect the um, the choice of chunk size. So if you look at the uh, this, the uh, the loop at the bottom of this example here, so uh, I have a, a parallel loop, and you know for whatever reason I've chosen to use if I if I use a a static schedule with a chunk size of one, then what I will have is that you know, uh, neighboring values of i will be executed by different threads. So that's what static one will cause to happen uh, and therefore I will get different threads accessing and updating neighboring values in the array B um, so I can also get this effect from 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 this kind of uh, uh, from this kind of code as well um, in this case what will typically happen is that you will see that um, Although you might think that you know for load balance reasons a small chunk size is is going to be best, what you will find is that if you do experiments, then you will find that um, the 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 optimal chunk size is not one. It'll be you know it'll be something larger than one, so maybe eight or sixteen or something like that. So that's communication. So that's quite hard. Um, that's quite the problem with communication is that it's really quite difficult to detect when these effects are happening because they're all down to you know, subtle effects effectively they're subtle effects in the memory system so it's quite hard to either look at a program and say yes that's definitely going to be a problem or it's hard to actually get any analysis of your program to to show what's going on um, I'll talk a bit about the end about using tools to to uh, to help you with with performance tuning. So the last of my six evils is hardware resource contention. Um, so the design of shared memory hardware is some you know the uh, it is a cost versus performance trade off. Um, what that means in practice is that there are shared resources which, if all the cores try to access them at the same time, do don't scale. Um, or if you like, if you put it the other way around, you know, if you're a sort of glass half full person rather than than than, than uh, glass half empty, then if so, an, an application running on a single core, sorry, that this uh, there's a typo in my slide there. That should say single core, not single code. It's able to access more than its fair share of the resources. Okay? Um, so that means when you do scaling tests, you see less than ideal speed up because with your sequential code gets more than its fair share of resources. So in particular, the things we, we probably care about here are that cores, and hence the OpenMP threads running on them can contend for our memory bandwidth is the big one, uh, but also cache capacity. Okay? Uh, so we often have uh, modern processors have some levels of cache. Uh, so you know, modern Xeon processors, level three cache is, uh, is, is shared between all the cores. Uh, and also functional units, if we're using uh, simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading, then uh, threads may be contending for, uh, for access to uh, flipping point units, for example. So this is actually, memory bandwidth is actually a very common problem. So codes which are very bandwidth hungry uh, and that includes uh, quite a large proportion of typical uh, scientific application codes do tend to be very, uh, very memory bandwidth hungry. Um, so these will not scale linearly on most shared memory hardware. So the only thing you can do here is to try and reduce the bandwidth demands by improving locality and improving the reuse of data in caches. So that I mean that should benefit your sequential performance as well, but it's in particular it's going to benefit your multi-threaded performance because you have you know having multiple threads running puts even higher demands on the on the memory bandwidth, which uh, which it, you know, which the hardware may not be able to meet. <laughs> 
Okay, so just wanted to show you a little example here to to, to illustrate uh, illustrate things, what's going on. Okay, so this is an experiment that I did on one of the processors on Archer. So that's a, an Intel Ivy Bridge processor, which which has twelve cores. Every core has its own level one and level two caches, and then there's um, a thirty megabyte shared level three cache. Uh, and then there's 64 gigabytes of, of main memory, which is split across the two sockets. But I'm only considering one socket here, so I'm not I'm not looking at any numer effects. I'm just looking at at scaling it with memory bandwidth. So what I did was I took this piece of code. Okay, so it's a very simple parallel loop which just computes the sum of of an array and I basically uh, run this code often enough and so I do repeated executions of this loop and to so that I can get a sensible execution time and I can make sure that you know that the uh, you know, if the data can be resident in one of the caches then it will be so I, I avoid any sort of first time through effects so I do I do repeated executions of this and I ask the question okay so um, for different values of n, okay, so different sizes of the array, how much speed up do I get on different numbers of threads? So that's what, uh, that's what I'm showing on this graph here. So on the x-axis, I have the number of iterations of the loop. Uh, and on the y-axis, I have the speed up that I get. And then I have a different curve depending on how many threads I'm using. Okay, so the blue data points are two threads, the red ones are three threads, the green the green ones are on six threads, and the purple ones are on twelve threads. So you'll see what happens if the number of iterations is small at the left hand side here. So if the number of iterations is less than about fifty thousand or so then what happens is I don't get any speed up at all. In fact, I get slow down. The parallel code runs a lot slower than the sequential code here. And what's happening there is I'm is what, say what I've called death by synchronization. So that what's going on here is that the overhead of the parallel region is much too big to justify parallelizing that code. So, um, so the number of iterations that you need to break even might be quite surprising here. So, I, you know, I need tens of thousands of iterations because you know I've compiled that code with reasonable amount of optimization. The compilers are good; it generates efficient vectorized code uh, for that loop. So, uh, I, I really need a, a quite a large number of iterations before it's even worth parallelizing. Okay, so that's what's going on on, uh, on the left-hand side there. So move across, okay? So let's look at the two thread case. So that's the blue data points here. So once I've got enough work, then the the speed up reaches a factor of two, almost thereabouts, and it pretty much stays there no matter how big the array gets. So even when the array gets really big, so it doesn't fit in any of the caches anymore, all the accesses are to main memory. So I'm, 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 I'm really, making a big demand on the memory bandwidth, but only from two threads, then I could get two times to beat up. Okay. Now look at the red curve. So once I've overcome the uh, synchronization overheads, then the speed up goes up and it actually reaches a point where it's actually greater than three. So you might think that's weird. How can I get more than three times speed up on, on, on three threads? And the answer is for those particular for that particular size of the array, then that data fits into the level two caches for three cores, but it doesn't fit into the level two cache for one core. So I get this um, more than linear speed up effect because of the availability of more cache memory. However, as I increase the array size, that effect doesn't last very long, and I end up with uh, a speed up which is a bit less than three. So 
Now for six threads, the green curve. And so this eventually reaches a speed up of more or less six, but that doesn't last very long. So that soon drops down to a factor of about four and a half in the middle. So you know, can can maybe see my mouse pointer there. Okay, so this this region of the curve here is where where essentially um, the data fits in the level three cache, um, but I don't have enough bandwidth to sustain six cores all hammering the level three cache bandwidth to death. So I only get about four and a half times speed up. And as the data size gets bigger, I move over to the right here, eventually the data no longer fits in the level three cache. So I'm, now I'm contending for main memory bandwidth, uh, and that's even worse. Okay. So I, I, get, uh, I get less than four times speed up on, on six threads. Uh, and then you can see the same kind of effects for 12 threads as well. Okay. So I reach this, this uh, peak uh, when I'm accessing level three cache, where uh, I get a between sort of eight and nine times speed up on 12 threads. But then again, as soon as I get, as soon as the data size no longer fits in the level three cache, then I'm contending for, for memory bandwidth and the speed up drops right back down to this factor, which is a bit less than four. So this is a bit of an extreme example. Okay, so for large data sizes, this piece of code, this, uh, this loop is extremely bandwidth hungry. Okay, so the you know the floating point performance becomes totally irrelevant. It's all about how fast can I shift data out of memory and into the processes, uh, and because it's so memory bandwidth intensive, uh, the this the speed up is, uh, is 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 limited by the hardware. And this is um, although this is an extreme example, this uh, this kind of effect is very common in scientific codes, particularly if you have loops over large multidimensional array, um, then it's, you know, it's very easy to run into a situation where you just don't have enough memory bandwidth. Okay, so it's also possible to contend for cache space. So if we have this, uh, these shared caches, uh, shared level three caches, and some codes may not appear to scale well, because uh, if, I, if I only have, if I run on a single core, then that gets access to the entire level three cache. Whereas if I run on multiple cores, then that's, that cache space has to be divided up between the data used by different threads. So one thing to be aware of here is if you're, uh, if you're doing uh, particularly sort of linear algebra type computations, dense linear algebra type computations, then you might need to sort of tune the block size in your matrices um, if you tune that for a single thread uh, and then run multi-threaded code, then you might not get the right block size because every, essentially what's going to happen is every thread's going to try to utilize the whole cache um, for its blocks of data and, uh, uh, and it won't fit. Okay, so uh, hardware threads. So this is you know, using simultaneous multi-threading or what Intel hyper-threading. So this, this is a hardware feature which, is, uh, which allows us to run multiple threads per core uh, without incurring context switch overheads. If we do that, then OpenMP threads running on the same core will contend for the functional units, so particularly floating point units as well as cache space and memory bandwidth. So using hardware threads tends to benefit codes where threads are idle because they're waiting on memory references. So this tends to be code which have, you know, non-contiguous or sort of pseudo-random or very scattered looking memory access patterns. Um, so, you know, codes which are very bandwidth hungry, so which are very common, or also codes which, which tend to saturate the floating point units so you know, dense linear algebra or fast Fourier transforms are examples of that. So they may not benefit either from this. So it may actually, it may actually turn out that, uh, that having 
uh, that using hard using ad additional these additional hardware threads actually causes your code to run slower. Um, so um, for these reasons, because this type of these types of code are common in scientific applications, a lot of systems are run in a mode where hardware threads are, are either completely disabled or they are not the default behavior. Okay? So uh, on Archer, for, ex for example, you have to specifically request um, use of hardware threads in your, in your, in, in your job script. So if we run, if we try to run more threads than we have hardware execution units, so whether that's cores, hardware threads, that's generally a bad idea. That's generally not going to work out well. Um, what will happen is that the operating system tries to give each thread a fair share of the execution units, um, but the cost of context switching is quite high. So the cost of stopping one thread and starting another is thousands or tens of thousands of clock cycles. And as we mentioned before, it tends to ruin your data locality because it, it causes threads to migrate between cores. Okay, so I said I would mention the sixth and a half thing right at the very end. So this is it, it's compiler opt optimization uh, problems. Um, this happens extremely rarely these days uh, because uh, OpenMP compilers are typically quite mature and have been well, well debugged. Um, but very rarely what, what can happen is that adding OpenMP directives uh, inhibits some the compiler from perform, performing its normal sequential optimizations. Uh, and the symptoms that you will see is that your one thread parallel code takes longer, takes significantly longer than the sequential code compiled without OpenMP. Um, if, this, if this does happen to you, it can be very hard to find a workaround. Um, sometimes it can be cured by, by making shared data private um, for example, or making local copies of variables in so variables that would otherwise be um, passed into subroutines. If you make a low, make a variable copy the values in, sometimes that kind of thing can fix it because it makes the compiler's analysis a bit easier. But in general, it's um, it, it's it's a really hard thing to deal with uh, because you have an idea, or at least it's very hard to get an idea of what's gone wrong inside the compiler. Um, but uh, but thankfully, it's pretty it's pretty rare these days. Um, but just so that you're aware that it's you know it it is an uh, an outside possibility if you do observe this behavior, if your you know if your one thread parallel code is a lot slower than your sequential code, then then maybe this is what's to blame. Okay, so um, um, dealing with performance problems is you know is all part of you know this uh, the the uh, you know there's a wider topic of. Uh, of performance optimization in, in general, um, so uh, you have to sort of get into a, uh, a sensible workflow to try and to try and do this kind of work. Um, so you know, again, a bit of a joke, but you know, so you're, my code's giving poor, poor speed up, and I don't know why. So what do what do you do now? Okay, so um, number one is what I hope you're not going to do is say, okay, OpenMP is a heap of junk uh, and give up, right? Um, so what you need to do to be able to systematically and effectively optimize code is, uh, you know, I, I like to think of it as doing as, as this kind of process. You need to classify and localize the sources of overhead. So you have to try and find out what type of problem is it, okay? Which one of the six evils is causing you the problem? And it might be more than one, okay? Um, and whereabouts in the code is it happening? Um, so use any available tools to help you. So that might just be timers. Right? You can get a lot out of timers. If you put a timing call around every parallel region, that really helps to localize the problem. So you know you can measure which, you can, you can calculate the speed up for all the different parallel regions in your program. So that helps you understand where the problem is. Um, but you know other things as well. Hardware counters, profiling tools can all be useful. Um, some of these things are quite difficult to learn how to use. They have quite a steep learning curve. Um, but you know it may be if you're going to do a lot of this kind of work, it's worth investing that sort of time. 
And obviously, okay, you want to fix the problems which are responsible for the large overheads first. Okay, there's no point fixing small problems and leaving big ones because that's not going to improve your performance very much. Okay, and then iterate. Once you fix one problem, you now go back, measure your measure the new code, and again try to identify uh, where and what the sources of overhead. So in terms of using tools, what we tend to find is that, you know, the standard type of code profilers, you know, so things like GProf on Linux or the type of profiles you, you find in, uh, in development environments can be rather confusing because typically what they do is that they will report the accumulated time uh, spent in functions across all the threads. So that tells you something, but, it's, um, but it can be really difficult to interpret what's going on there. As I said, you can get a lot out of using timers. You know, put a put timing calls around every parallel region. Put a timing call around the whole code. Then you know what's going on in every parallel region. And then by subtraction, you can work out how much time is spent in the sequential part of the program as well. Um, uh, so that gives you a really, uh, you know, a really good start, a really clear picture of uh, of where the performance problems are. Okay. So once you once once you understand where the, where where they are, then you can start thinking about well, what type of problem have I got? You know, which one of the six evils is biting me? Um, so there are some useful performance tools out there. So what's available will be depend very much on what system you're working on. Um, but so just to just to mention a few, uh, so there's a tool called Vampir, which um, you know produces uh, the sort of trace timelines that I showed at the beginning of this lecture to illustrate idle threads. So it produces you know, a real version of those from your code to show what's going on. can be very helpful for visualizing um, you know, uh, idle thread behavior, so load imbalance or waiting for entry to critical sections and that kind of thing. Um, Intel VTune um, does, something, uh, does something similar, so you can also see uh, you know, you, you can also get it to tell you, but again, produce timelines and show you, you know, what's happening, you know, when, when threads are used for work and when they're, when they're idle, doing, you know, waiting for, waiting at barriers and that kind of thing. Uh, and also produce you know, statistics about how long am I spending in, in barriers and locks and this, this kind of stuff. Uh, so Oracle Studio, I think, is dead. I think that's uh, that. I should take that off this list because I think that's uh, the that's no longer available. Uh, if you're working on Archer, then there's a Cray tool called Craypat, so you can turn on um, uh, OpenMP profiling in Craypat to tell you about you know, time spent in parallel, you know, parallel region overheads and that kind of thing. Um, it's quite a nice, uh, freely available tool called Scalaska, which uh, does try to do what I'm, you know, uh, the way I've, you know, try to do things the way I've kind of talked about it, which is to try to break down overheads into different categories. So it it, it uh, very much uses this idea of trying to classify and localize um, overheads. So, you uh, know, it. it um, it basically has this kind of three-dimensional view of your program. So, which is, so the three dimensions are whereabouts in the program, what sort of problem it is, and which of the parallel um, processing elements, whether that's processes or threads, yeah, is causing the problem. So, it's a, basically trying to give you, um, and, and you can sort of slice those views in, in different ways. Um, so, I, I quite I quite like that one. Uh, and then the final one to mention is a, is a thing called Paratools Thread Spotter. So this is one of the only tools that will really tell you stuff about communication overheads. Um, so it's very good at finding uh, cache and memory problems, uh, including things like false sharing. Um, that's because it works in a very different way. So uh, all the other tools are basically doing uh, some sort of runtime instrumentation to figure out where the time is being spent. What ThreadSpotter is doing is, is it's actually taking a statistical sample of the memory accesses in your program and then replaying them through a cache and memory simulator. And so it works, it, it's a tool that works in a very different way, but it 
it allows it to to say useful things about the memory system behavior which the other tools really are unable to do okay great so that's the end of the uh, end of this talk uh, uh, and and indeed the end of the course um so thank you very much for for listening and i'm very happy to take any any questions if you go to the uh the uh, course web page on on the archer website uh, go down to the bottom you'll see there's a link to a to a chat page um so you can uh, you can post stuff on there and i'll, I'll keep monitoring that and, and i can answer uh, in the longer term uh what you can what you can do is uh, is uh, post uh questions to the uh to the forum on the on the openmp.org website um, I, I tend to answer questions on there as well. So if you're using the, um, you know, if you are making use of uh, of, of Cirrus and work exercises, um, obviously, you know, you're very welcome to ask questions about that. Um, we'll keep your accounts open until the end of uh, end of the year, so that you can uh, uh, keep on working on that if you'd like to. Okay, so the question is, um, any thoughts on combining OpenMP and MPI? Uh, yes, plenty of thoughts. That's, uh, that's a topic that uh, we cover in, uh, in both the advanced OpenMP and uh, advanced MPI courses that, uh, that we run under, under Archer. So, um, yeah, if you want to have a look at, if, you, um, if you're not able to uh, you know, attend one of those courses in person, then uh, go and have a look at the past course Material for those courses on uh, on 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 the Archer uh, web page. I'll, I'll post links on the on the chat page for you. So if you uh, if you, if you uh, click on one of those links, you you'll find a uh, a, a set of slides about uh, uh, combining MPI and OpenMP. And I should say I'm happy to answer questions about that if you've got any. Okay, this question is, is OpenMP more suited for increasing performance on single processor systems than multiple processor systems? Okay, um, this depends what you mean by processor here. Okay, so um, yes. Uh, so uh, OpenMP really requires shared memory. So if you have a, you know, a cluster system, which is, uh, you know, where multiple nodes connected with a network, then you can't use OpenMP for that. You need to use MPI. It would be the, would be the preferred tool.